Hey there, I've decided to do another video, similar to the last one, same kind of format, but this time on a different topic. We're going to be talking about why we have an import player problem in RLCS and what we can do now to stop it becoming even worse in the future. And in the grand scheme of things, what we have in Rocket League is not that big a problem compared to lots of other esports and sports around the world. But if we catch it before it becomes a problem, those rules interjecting later down the line won't be as uh, dangerous to the ecosystem as they could be um, if we just do them now you know like we've we've got a lot of players in north america who aren't native to north america and these players are being very successful complexity furia uh genji for example and then we've got some going over to apac and also having success there so i wanted to explore the reasons why it's happening what's the problem with it and and what we can do to fix it so i guess we've got a lot of a lot of stuff to go through um, you can check out the contents of the, the video here. So history of import players, moving to a stronger region, moving to a weaker region, uh, the structure of RLCS leading to imports, how many import players in a team is fair. We'll discuss like different rules around that. When does someone become native to their new regions? We'll discuss around the uh, the cases like Turbo Pulsar, like I would consider him a North American player now because he's been there for so long. Um, but at what point does that become the case? Uh, learning from other esports, import rules, then a conclusion and some ideas from me and how we can fix it in the future. So I think the most important thing here is to catch you guys up on the history of import players. I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of, of these cases. Um, but we look back at Season 7. That was our first import player. And it was the uh, the number one player in OC at the time, Drippe. Went over to NA and it wasn't as successful as people were hoping for. Um, they didn't qualify. I think they came fifth, meaning they missed out on the four spots for NA LAN. I can't remember the exact. It was fifth or sixth, something like that. So Drippe was um, unfortunately not able to make it. They, as a player, did do well at some LANs. Um, like some dream hacks, but they didn't manage to qualify through NA. So I think they went back to OC not too long after that. And then the next import was Turbo Pulsar, a quite a famous import. Went over to NA as the three-time world champion at the time. Joined NRG um, and took them to the uh, the winning spot at season eight. So that was a successful import. Uh, and then shortly after that, stayed in NA in in, in other teams. Uh, True Neutral, all moving, uh, who then became Complexity, all moved over to NA, and that was the first full team move we saw with South American uh, number one team, True Neutral at the time, moving. Uh, and then this last season of RLCS was where we start to really see imports become a big thing. Obviously, there was a bit of a gap where COVID was between Season 8 and the um, modern era RLCS, but in the, uh, the full split for 22-23 season, we saw Furia copy True Neutral and move over to NA. Apparently, Jack and Nolly went together to NA. CRR came over from EU to NA to, to replace um, Shad, I think it was, on, on True Neutral. Um, and then, yes, it was Shad. Uh, and then Cami and Virtuoso went to APAC. OSM went to APAC, but OSM was there, the coach of the team that he joined. Um, so it's all, it's all quite complicated. All that happened at the same time. So suddenly, imports was a big thing. Uh, and then we saw Lost go over to NA to uh, join Furia. Um, so we've had a lot more recently and there's definitely concerns over next season this being even more of a thing especially as we're starting to see now a lot of European players a lot of South American players who are exploring the options to potentially go to NA um, and the same thing with APAC as well um, because there's that potential for high earning in NA and there are some weird cases that I wanted to bring up because these are uh, ones where I think it's been interesting to see the case study of them so in particular there was the the rise situation where he was exploring moving to na and that failed due to the time and the the visa issues and the big change and how much of a move it was and rise deciding not to do that um there was the famous na squad going on holiday to sub-saharan africa to try and win some regionals out there there was Atachi to eu this was when there was no region for Atachi to play in who's from morocco so he moved to Europe, where he was playing mostly with European players and teams at the time. So once he turned 15, um, I believe he moved over to, to Europe. And then there's also like a few cases of studying abroad or longer trips abroad. So Misty, who was in APAC, came over to Europe. Now, they never made it into a top team. But, you know, should they be allowed to compete in RLCS? Because technically, if they did that now, they would have been an APAC player moving to EU and so on. Um, so their reason for changing region was not because of rocket league uh, and there's also back in the day snowy from sub-saharan africa was on a trip in europe and played in some insomnias and stuff like that so i'm wondering what's the ruling around those um and then there's also like the the, the non-natives who live in other regions so for example doomsy when apac first came about doomsy was a um season two 
and season one top player in Europe um, and in the early days of Rocket League was one of the best players in Europe and he lives in Japan now for reasons completely irrelevant to competing and just happened to be in APAC when APAC kicked off again so he started playing again uh, in those situations should there be rulings to stop those people um, and so that's what these weird cases are quite good at looking at is those niche scenarios and there's quite a lot of players who live in regions that aren't their native regions if you look at the APAC players you can see there's a lot of country flags that aren't native to APAC but there's lots of people who live in in other regions um, due to family reasons or, or studying or whatever so we're going to look at some of the the more specific um, situation so I think when we look at the the current decisions as there's moving to a stronger region which typically happens South America to North America and then we've also got moving to a weaker region which would be um, people moving to APAC um, which has been the the two cases we've we've really seen um, so I want to sort of look at the advantages and disadvantages of doing so um, so the the big advantage of moving to a stronger region especially for the South American players is you can earn more spots for your region so now we have more Brazilian representation uh, and South American reputation at majors and worlds just due to the fact that complexity and furia have managed to make events after moving regions and that sort of overrides the structure of RLCS which has led to uh, certain regions not being able to get more than two or one spot at, at, at majors um, it improves competition in those regions, so in theory, it's better practice for international competition for the for the players who are moving, um, and they'll often get paid more due to the region being uh, more popular, more eyes on it, uh, a more lucrative region um, for sponsors and stuff. Um, so then, the disadvantage would be it can be harder to qualify, as we saw with Furia, they didn't make um, they didn't make majors, didn't make worlds, um, which is something we'd expect from them. Uh, and it can be hard to do with visas, especially moving to NA. I don't think people realize quite how hard it is. That's why Jack and Nolly went to Canada first, because it's a lot easier to go to Canada than it is to America. So getting those visas can be quite tough. Uh, in esports, it's not too bad because you can get sort of like a, a sports player visa quite quickly, especially with the more established organizations. Um, but it can be a little bit more tricky for, for certain um, individuals. There is also the the stronger regions point of view having these imports so it can be an advantage having this increased diversity uh, and strengthens the region's depth i think it's all it's fair to say that north america has become a deeper region since the imports have come over which has meant that teams down to like eight nine ten are now teams that are capable of competing and making a major i mean we saw it last season um teams like optic uh version one furia complexity all in that sort of an nrg as well all in that sort of six through nine area of, of north america so it's increased the depth of the region um and <coughs> um i don't know what this means here can help teams qualify succeed if not i don't know what that means i don't know why i put that why i put that there um if not complete teams i guess this was uh Oh, of course. I, I've, I've just realised what I'd written. I wrote this a few days ago. I wanted to wait until after Games 8 to put this out. Um, so I, um, I wrote this down. I missed a letter here. It should be, if not complete teams. Um, so this was in the case of something like Turbo Pulse moving over. It can help um, or you know, like any team where they need a player like CRR going over to help complexity out. You, know, you can import players to strengthen a... Um, native player like Chronic as well with the two European players supporting him so you can help teams or players qualify that otherwise might have struggled by importing players from outside the region so that's what that's referring to um, and a disadvantage would be that you know the spots of the region's natives is going down so there is less American and Canadian players qualifying for lands now off the back of all the imports in North America um, and it can, in theory, and this is a questionable thing, who knows where it's the case, but it can reduce the development of the bubble scene because there is a greater barrier to entry for some of these up-and-coming players. We saw teams like Dignitas manage to uh, qualify for LAN, um, and would they have been able to do that easier if there were less of these import teams? Um, so there's definitely some question marks around that, whether that's the case. It may reduce... Um, by, by bubble scene, you could almost refer to them as the bubble teams, the teams that just don't quite make it into uh, into the major. They bubble out of making the major. So those those teams are now one one spot lower in the North American rankings because of it. Um, and then, yes, it reduces the region's representation at inter international or interregional events. So 
the, the the stronger region i think loses out more with imports it's more like the the reason why teams are moving to na is not to make na better but it's to go in and and sort of take advantage of the of the region right um and then the opposite is true of i, I guess typically the region loses out no matter what right so um Teams moving to a weaker region, they'll be able to qualify for lands, where otherwise it would be tough. So look at someone like Virtuoso, I don't know, and OSM. I don't think they'd be able to qualify for majors if it as, as easily as they have done through APAC if it wasn't for that ability to compete in APAC. Um, and they can experience greater success. So, you know, like, uh, whether it feels like better success or not, ultimately, if you're winning regionals, that's more enjoyable experience uh, for a player and potentially more of a... Um, a much better one to try and get a contract for to get a, a, an esports org to represent you is if you're a winning team right if you're coming first second like top four anything like that in a region you're gonna you're gonna be much more marketable to an organization than a team that's coming like fifth to eighth and still qualifying for land right because those fifth to eighth teams are unlikely to be seen as winners even though technically they might be better than the teams that are winning in another region so the experiencing greater success is a more marketable package for an esports organization um but you will be seen a bit of a, as a villain and stealing spots is something that definitely happened um in particular with um the apac region people were quite vocal about them moving over to the region um a lot of the time it's people talking on behalf of um the natives but there will be some people from apac who will be frustrated by by this um, but you've got to remember it is hard to do as well. Um, so visas aren't as easy as people think. Moving to a whole new region, a whole new country isn't as easy as you think. Um, so the fact that people have been wanting to take those risks and still succeed is definitely something to to talk about because that is a big disadvantage with this whole thing. It's not as comfortable to do as people think. Um, so the weaker regions, the advantages is it could increase the diversity and the strength in the region's depth in theory. Uh, we have seen the APAC region improve in quality off the back of this. I would say potentially the going to majors has been a bigger factor for APAC. If we compare something like Sub-Saharan Africa and APAC, where they were both at a similar-ish level, with APAC maybe being slightly higher than Sub-Saharan Africa at the start, I think it's fair to say that Sub-Saharan Africa hasn't progressed as much, and I think a lot of it comes down to going to majors and uh, qualifying for majors, going to those, re those stronger regions, playing ranked in those stronger regions and everything, you know. Uh, the SSA players develop a lot when they're at Worlds because they get to, you know, play ranked on low ping again, you know. Um, so there's definitely some something to be said about the major spots being more of a factor for APAC potentially. But yeah, of course, the more strong teams in your region that you can scrim with and compete with, uh, you'll develop more for sure. Um, and then I think this one is the key one. I think this is the realized situation. We saw, you know, Elevate win two out of their five series, almost winning the, the third to qualify into the main event for Worlds. Um, that would never have happened for a player like Realize in the past. It was only possible for him because he brought Virtuoso over with Cami to try and sort of bump his his team level higher. He as an individual is internationally capable. Like we could clearly see Realize was often the strongest player in, um, in individual games, which is a sign of a player who can compete on an international stage. But as far as APAC players go, there's not a huge amount of options for, for Realize to pick from. So in order to, to set himself up for success, he asks these people to come and play with him. Um, and so for those standout individuals, having those imports to come bump you up can be quite a good thing. Um, and again, the same idea of the, the native stolen in, uh, spots by imports uh, and the reduced region's representation into inter-regional events. Uh, we did see at Game as a uh, quite a sad nationality thing between a North American team and an APAC team, I believe it was where the APAC team was an EU and an NA player, and the NA team was two, two non-natives. I can't remember the exact scenario, but it was like no one on the pitch was representing their region, uh, which was a really unique and interesting spot to be in. So um, I think we've got to talk a lot about the structure of RLCS, which is leading to these imports, uh, and why certain regions don't tend to be moved to or from, and why certain regions um, don't tend to have um many import players in them uh so i think the first thing to look at is definitely the the structure of worlds and majors in the past so it started off season one two was four eu four na then it became two oce joining in then from season seven onwards we had the two south american teams join in um and around this early season three to season six stage that's where we start to see 
the strongest OCE teams start to rise and, and be internationally competitive. Uh, and then we saw the same thing with South America. Once they started coming along to Worlds, uh, they started to improve their, their quality. And then we saw them them cook over the COVID era where the South American teams then looked really strong when we came back out of COVID era into the majors. And this is where we saw the 16 team major format, which I think is a big problem. And it's hopefully something that will get changed next season because we've got five EU, five NA, two OCE, two SAM still. You can't really take away spots. That's the problem with this. It's really hard to take away spots from teams um, whilst also giving opportunity to some regions. And we saw Mina get added and APAC get one spot too. And I think the biggest uh, frustration for a lot of people is the the one Mina spot is not fair because Mina have consistently, in both seasons they've been involved in RLCS, have consistently got a top eight performing region spot, um, despite the adversity, because in the first season, they didn't even get to go to one of the lands and they still managed to get it by getting a, a dead last finish at uh, San Diego due to visa issues. They still managed to get that top eight performing region spot. Um, and so this is what we saw was the one MENA team and then the one APAC slot is a good thing, helped develop the region. Um, and then the SSA um, situation, like I think they should get a chance to compete at majors. If they're a region within our circuit, they should be allowed to compete at the inter-regional event at the end of each split. So this brings us on to a debate later on in the, the video and I'll probably do a whole separate video about what I think about formats and, and everything like that. Uh, so if you want to you want to hear that, let me know because I definitely have a lot of things to say about the current RLCS format and what I would want to be seen changed um, to make it more fair for all the regions and everything. And then of course we see our current worlds have that top eight performing regions slot where last season it was four EU, two NA, one Mina, one Sam, um, and then the rest of the wild card gets distributed. I think pretty fairly. I think two spots for each region plus EU and NA getting an extra one. Um, I think that's kind of fair, but um, there's definitely question marks as to why there is still such a difference in preference over all these regions, especially as we've seen, for example, MENA seem to be stronger than OCE, yet still have less spots than them. Uh, South America have shown to be very strong, and now consequently, a lot of the NA teams are South American representatives too. So um, very interesting how this structure has led to a lot of the imports. And I think it's also important to talk about the hierarchy of pay. Now, this isn't something that we can confirm or deny. This is just based off of what I know and the kind of feel for the for the regions and who gets paid what. Um, but I believe this is the, 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 the hierarchy of which region gets paid the best. NA is highest, then EU, then probably MENA, just purely based on the fact that MENA as a region has a lot of uh, Saudi Arabian players and Saudi Arabian orgs and their general ecosystem, as we've seen with Gamers 8, has a lot more money in general. So... I do think they get paid well there, uh, which is another reason why um, it's quite weird that they, they get, they as a region, they only have one spot. Um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, South America, you know, they've got um, slightly lower pay, but, you know, they still got quite a, a good system, right? They've got a lot of big orgs out there. Um, and then you've got OCE next after that. OCE as a region generally is quite a low paying region in all esports. Um, so that's carried over there. Um, APAC next probably it could be slightly different with APAC I think potentially they get paid slightly more than OCE in the top cases um, but I'm just going based off of the history and um, APAC's quite a new region so it's hard to know but potentially APAC might be higher just based off of the top teams there and then SSA um, down at the bottom there unfortunately not much money in sub-Saharan Africa um, so that's sort of another thing to bear in mind as to why these import players would happen because generally you're going to move up this system in some way. You're going to go somewhere where you can get paid more, but also have a better chance of qualifying for majors. So that's like the two reasons why you do it. Um, I think it's, it's also, we haven't spoken about the rules. There is currently no rules stopping import players. Um, as far as I know, you've just got to be in the region that you're playing in. Um, there's no ruling around residency, like legal res residency and stuff like that. I think in some cases, players have essentially been on holiday when they first started playing for a region. Um, and we have seen uh, the, the speed at which someone can turn around the moving of region be quite quick. So there's definitely very limited rules around imports. I think they have to be approved by Psyonix. So maybe that's that's something. I think it would definitely be uh, a part of the, the fact. And I think Sonic's probably just encouraging it and saying, yes, that's fine. 
Um, cause I assume if you're changing regions, you have to almost like confirm that's what's happening. Um, so the import rules that we could potentially change would be how, how many players in a team are allowed to be imported. And it's something that you see in other esports. So there's the one, the idea of a one third rule, um, where you'd have one player on a team is allowed to be imported. So like the, the turbo pulsar situation would be a great example of using the import rule where you could have a top player come over and essentially when you when you switch out one third of your roster as many teams do just generally you'd be allowed to pick a player from anywhere so um as long as there's no other imports in the team so when turbo pulse had joined nrg um fireburner was retiring they needed to find someone to replace him so they explored all regions and turbo pulse to that spot so that's one potential there's also a two-third situation so this is what we see with Elevate and Gen G, where we have two players who are imports and then the one superstar player from the local region. Um, so it does mean that that team still has representation for their region. Um, you know, we saw Chronic being the only uh, American player left in uh, the Boston Major. And that's, I think, so, that, you know, it does help with that. And then you've also got like the realized situation where, you know, it's a chance for him to be boosted up in the rankings into regionally based off of having two import players support him so it can be a good good idea to have that two-thirds rule potentially uh, and then the current rules allows anything so you can have full teams just moving as a typo there furia um being allowed to move for example um so that's that's where we currently are is that a whole team could move regions if they wanted to or in, in theory you could have three players from anywhere in the world all move to a certain region and play there you, know, you could have like a APAC player, a Sub-Saharan African player, and an OCE player all move to Europe and play there, for example. Um, and I think the questions we've got to, we've got to ask with this is, should the quality or the, the size of the region, how many spots they have, for example, should that affect how many people in a team are allowed? So should NAB have a different ruling to APAC? Um, and then, you know, is their non-competitive reason going to affect the decision so like we mentioned before there's some cases where people are just traveling due to their family or they've moved uh, for personal reasons um or they've uh, they're just away studying or whatever it is should that that change things or like for example if um a player wants to go study in in america for crl right like i think there's some european players moving to north america next season to play in crl would they then be allowed to compete in rlcs um and not be considered an import because they're technically on a on a st student visa in america um and also how would you classify players who've already been in a region for a while so for example i used to coach creams on dark zero he's technically got the welsh flag his family isn't from uh canada but he lives in canada so does that mean he's not a, a native to the region and how long has he had to have lived in north america before he's considered a native to the region in those situations and then also the questions would be around would players be able to move back so where we saw furia make a change and we saw um complexity make a change they had south american players who then moved back to the south american region and continued competing in south america afterwards um, or like when Drippe moved back to OCE, for example, should those players be able to just freely move back to their native region after the fact? So these are all things that we'd have to think about when creating the rules. Um, and I think the, the question around when does a player become native to a new region, I think that's a an interesting case study with someone like Turbo Pulsar, right? Because um, when he stayed in NA afterwards, he was very much considered an NA player. And I think he still lives in North America now after retiring, right? So has he officially just moved there as part of his lifestyle, you know? Um, so would would he be able to just move back to Europe and not be considered an import if we created these import rules? Or does he freely allowed to be playing for EU and NA, right? Um, so I think that's something we've got, we've got to consider with these kinds of rules. Um, is there going to be some kind of memory within the rules of what your initial region was? So for example, someone like Doomsy, his initial region was Europe. He stopped playing for several years and then is suddenly in APAC. Does he maintain that initial region um, lock of some sort to, to mean that he's considered an import player? Um, and if that's the case, that's where you start thinking with the one third rule that could really limit teams' ability to, to select players at some point. Um, especially if we start seeing a lot of imports where, you know, let's say in 10 years time, if each region has a whole mixture of people like we see in some other esports 
would those players all struggle to be able to play together, right? Like, for example, now, if CRR suddenly wanted to play with Nolly and Jack on Gen G, say that move happened, that's an NA team to NA team transfer, but technically you've then got a team full of Europeans. So if there was a two-third rule, for example, would that be considered an illegal move, you know? Um, and is that healthy to have that as well? So we've got there's a lot of questions around that, and I think a lot of these rules would depend on Cyanix's long-term game plans for how long they hope to um, to keep this this eSport going and, and everything like that. Because if you start thinking, what's it going to look like in five years' time? That's when you start to think about these native rules and how much that could affect it. So it's not as simple as let's just make it a one-third or a two-third rule because it then starts to create this potential friction around uh, the native region and initial region and the memory of their initial region. So I think the best thing we can do is learn from sports and other esports. I think sports is quite hard to do because typically things where there's imports and teams, they have massive teams. So therefore import rules are really easy to implement because, you know, like if you've got a team of 11 to 15 people, whatever, whatever sport it is, it's really easy to be like, well, you have to keep like five or six of those 11 people from the, the country that you're competing in. Um, but then you do often have in sports, you have a lot of problems around national teams having people who are from other countries. So for example, I, I like my cricket and in cricket, the English cricket team has often had South Africans, Australians, uh, people from, um, you know, like Ireland we had, our captain was from Ireland, but if they've got, if they've got the kind of like sports ruled, uh, nationality linkage to the country that they're representing, they're often allowed to play for them. Um, but it does come a bit of a problem when your whole team starts to not represent the country you're from. Uh, so there's definitely been questions around that stuff in the past for sports. But for esports, um, I think we, I've done a lot of research on this. I went away and had a look into a lot of things. So League of Legends, they have an interregional movement policy. So it's teams of fives in League of Legends. And um, in the LEC, and I think this is the same for all the leagues, on the LCS, sorry, which is the North American league they have to have at least three north american residents uh, which is considered players that either grew up in the u.s or have lived in the country for four years to be on each roster so that's their ruling um so every team in the lcs has at least one import sometimes two so that shows you how important imports were for them because uh, as is the case in a lot of esports uh there is a stronger region where you want to get people from um and it's rumored that in 2024 they're maybe allowing three imports per team um and this rule was implemented because in the past there was a huge number of korean players uh leaving the the korean league to join chinese teams and it was called the korean exodus um and this meant that a lot of a lot of teams didn't maintain their identity of their original region so they, they implemented those rules to try and help with that kind of problem um and then there was also a big problem uh, where there was a full all Chinese roster that began competing in China and then moved to the LCS to compete in the North American League. So similar to what we've seen with um, Complexity or Furia in North America. So they've dealt with the problems that we're currently dealing with and they consequently created this interregional movement policy, which I think is quite a good case study for what we could do. And when you look at the kind of ratios, I feel like the one third rule would potentially make the most sense, but maybe because of Rock League being a three person team, it's slightly different. Maybe two thirds would be would be more fair. Valorant are uh, run by the same people as League of Legends, so Riot implemented a very similar rule. Um, it's just turned to franchise, so they got three regions, which is the Americas, EMEA. Well, they got four regions technically: Americas, EMEA, Pacific, and China. Um, and they have a rule that means you can only have one player from a different region. Um, I reckon it will increase with time, similar to League of Legends has done. Um, so I think it's important to note the Valorant ecosystem has just been freshly made and it's one of the most recently formed uh, league systems that's ever, ever been done in esports. So they've learned from all the other esports and what they've done to try and counteract what we described before with the major spots, they have a system where each event throughout a season, spots are earned at the next event by the winning team from the previous event. So Fnatic won the first event lock in so therefore your or emea got another spot in the next event and then Fnatic won the second event so they got two extra spots for the next event the problem with that is that Fnatic are by far the strongest team in the emea and so you had a lot of weaker teams at those events because the winning team didn't necessarily represent the depth of the region 
something similar could happen in Rocket League, for example, if a North American team, like this is talking in the past, um, if a North American team won an event, uh, the fifth North American team invited along or the sixth North American team invited along would not most likely not be as good as the fifth or sixth European team to be invited along. So, you know, the depth of the region isn't necessarily the same as the winner. Um, but it's an interesting system to have. I mean, we have a similar system in Rocket League where we have the top eight performing teams earn more spots to their region for Worlds. So there is some similarities there, but um, definitely something to consider the way Valorant have done things. But they are a franchise league, so it's slightly easier to control where where players move in a franchise system then you got csgo which is an interesting ecosystem and it's i didn't put a lot of research into this because um i was going i asked a friend about it and they didn't get back to me in time but i did a lot of looking through liquipedia and look at csgo teams they have a very international um s scene where there's a lot of mixed teams from in especially in the european region but one thing that we've seen with cs is pretty much all of the best players have moved to Europe and consequently Europe is this just power powerhouse region. It also means when they're practicing, they can all practice in the same region and so on. Um, one thing to note with games like CSGO is they do have region locking within the game itself. So you can't compete in different regions unless you have a like a, an account for a different region. It's similar in Valorant and League of Legends and a lot of other games. So there's an element of the in-game locking you into certain regions. Um, but CS has an open structure, which recently is becoming more open because they did have ability to, they had some partner teams that would buy slots to be able to guarantee their qualification to events. And what we saw with that is some teams who weren't very good would buy their spot and then consequently guarantee qualification for an event, even though they weren't very good. So there is, there's some complexity there with the open system that's like a pseudo open with some franchise spots in a way. Um, but I think you, in CS they've had pretty fluid movement of players in the past. I know full, t full rosters have moved from weaker regions over to North America like South Africa, OCE, Brazil. Those kind of um, teams have often moved to uh, North America to gain spots there. Um, and yeah, I think the, the importing of players is very common in CSGO, but because there's theirs is a more open LAN system and less region locked in the first place, um, in terms of like they haven't got a localized, as localized a league structure at the top level, um, it doesn't really matter that you're representing your region as much in CSGO from what I can tell. I might be wrong with that. Feel free to let me know if I'm wrong with that. Uh, a fun one to look at is Overwatch, and this is the... The problem that we've got to watch out for in Rocket League, we don't want Europe to take over all the regions. I don't think it would happen, but there is potential that it could start to become a problem where the representation of the regions gets skewed a little bit. But you can see here, this is the most recent Overwatch uh, League uh, where they had 59% of the players from South Korea and a lot from US and China as well. But ultimately, these teams all represent a city. So these are teams that are like there's like, for example, there's a London team. There's a, all these American cities that have teams. There's a Seoul team, all this kind of stuff. So for the South Korean cities, it makes sense to have a full South Korean team and often have the best South Korean players, for example. That would make a lot of sense. But what we see is like the London Spitfires was a full South Korean team at one point. And it's like that doesn't represent the city that they're going for. Um and obviously it's arbitrary which cities got selected for the Overwatch League. They just It was a franchise system where they chose a bunch of cities. But still, it seems very unusual to have this full like South Korean takeover. Obviously, it's the highest quality of gameplay, but you don't then have that connection with the, the localized team and region, um, which you see, for example, with the French players in Rocket League. They've got a very good connection with their fan base because they are French teams representing French orgs in the region that they're from. So Overwatch, definitely a case study of what I don't think we should ever get to. And I don't think we ever will, because I don't think we have this much dominance from a certain region. Uh, but it's definitely something to think about. Um, so I, this, was an, this was an interesting one. So Apex was the game which I did the most research into, just purely because Apex is a three-player game. Um, and so it's got a lot of similarities to what we have. Um, they have a lot more teams qualify for lands, because obviously it's a battle royale. They need, you know, 20 times however many games they want to play to try and fill out the arena so they have a lot of players there and they have a lot of different regions as well um and i looked into the rules for it to see if there was any rules around 
which country you can be from. So you can have a little read of this, but I'll, I'll read out the the m most important part of it. And is um, the sufficiency? It's basically saying you have to be from one of these countries to compete in the ALGS, not to compete in that region, but just to compete in the whole system. So it's basically stopping people from countries that aren't allowed to compete in it to be in there. So, for example, you couldn't be in in a a country that's um, got a problem. Um, I'm not going to name any countries that don't cause any drama, but if you're, you know, for, for example, if there was a war going on and a, and a country was not meant to, meant to be internationally mingling or they're from a country that's not allowed to internationally mingle, then uh, they, they could potentially be taken off that list of, of legible countries. But anyway, um, the regions are divided, as you can see there. you got EMEA, North America, South America, APAC North, APAC South. Um, and with that, there's a whole list of all the countries in there. I just I've just screenshotted the top of it of the appendix B there, so you can see at the start of the list. Um, ultimately, there's a lot of countries on that list. Um, as you can see, region grouping is only for the purposes of LGS and are not indicative of official geographic regions. Um, so basically, this is saying that you do not have to necessarily play in the region that you're from. Now, there are a few import teams and players, one of which was Dark Zero. This is why I wanted to look into this, because I used to be part of Dark Zero, and they, have a, they had a full Australian team that technically competed in the North American region, which you can see there uh, on the screen. It says uh, North America, they're a full OCE team. And I looked around to see if there's any other teams that didn't represent their region that they qualified from. And the only other team that I noticed this with was Pioneers, who had one North American player who were previously on Furia, or maybe they were being loan from fury or something or maybe they just subbed in for this event but yeah this was a north american player on a european team uh, which i thought was quite interesting um so with that you can see that for the most part and, and if you go through their liquid for the most part players represent their region just because it's the like we said before it's quite hard to move regions it's not easy to do uh, and there's not a huge amount of reasons to do it the main reasons you do it in apex would be to represent an org in their in their region or like this case OCE players don't tend to get paid very well when they're in their home region so OCE players moving to America is a chance for them to be more successful and lucrative within their esport so that was Apex and I was also just thought it was interesting to look at some single player location rules so single player games as you can imagine don't really care as much about what region you're from you can be anywhere you want and compete but there's often some rules around which region you represent when it comes to qualification because uh, each region will have slightly different systems. So, for example, I work in Pokemon, and in Pokemon, each region, um, you earn points within your region to get potential, like, rewards to travel to events. So, like, for example, the top X players in Europe would get uh, travel awards to the next big event or might qualify for Worlds through getting a certain amount of points. Um and the interesting thing about that is you, your points that you get from an event in another country contribute towards your points in your region. So you can essentially travel as a European player to North America, compete in a North American event, get the points there. It gets added to your total within your region um, and you're essentially stealing points from that region. And what we often see in Pokemon that can be a bit of a problem um, is North American players towards the end of the season when they're all racing for that top X amount of spots will go down to South American events um, to try and steal the points there that other players within their region aren't playing for, essentially. So it's a chance for them to overtake other people within their region. So that happens quite a lot. Um, but what this does create is it creates a sort of pay, pay slash travel to win. So because you get access to more events, you can then overtake all the people within your region who only have access to your regional events. Um, it would essentially be like if someone in RLCS in Europe travelled back and forth between EU and NA week by week to compete in RLCS in the other region, but then the points they got from the RLCS in North America added to their European total, and so essentially they got access to more points-earning opportunities than anyone in their region. Um, so single-player circuits often struggle with this. I think fighting games often have that, and a Street Fighter has a bit of a problem with um, you know the accessibility to travel being such a big factor for success if you can travel to all of your european events and travel overseas for some events you get access to more opportunities to earn points so um, there's definitely a pay to win aspect to it there 
So there's a lot of information there. And the reason I wanted to share some of the other esports is I'm trying to show that there is no right answer. There's no correct way to do it. I think every esport has found their own solution based off of how their ecosystem works. And some of them don't have a solution. Like we saw in Overwatch where they just let the South Korean players travel to all the regions and compete in, in them. Um, and so there is definitely reactive corrections that have happened, like the League of Legends examples we spoke about. So maybe it's time for us to do that in Rocket League. So... Uh, just to finish off this video, I thought it'd be good to, to do that um, ruling that I believe would be fair um, to the system and what I personally believe should be the case. And this might not necessarily be the right thing to do. It might not be fair to do it, but this is what I'd do for next season if I if I was the one choosing the rules. So I'd require teams to have two or three native residents on their team. So players that either grew up in the country, lived in the region, have lived in the country for four years. So very similar to the um, to the ruling from League of Legends. Um, so essentially, you've got to keep two thirds of your roster as native. So you can have something like the Turbo Pulsar situation would be allowed, but what Gen G did wouldn't be allowed. Now, players who've played in zero RLCS regionals in any region and have a work visa or a residency in a new region can play in a new region. So ultimately, it's trying to just protect people. So this, these rules only apply to people who have competed in an RLCS regional event within their native region so if you're a new player say you're like for example if you're it's not going to happen because importing a 15 year old is crazy but say you just turned 15 and you're like zen for example right if, if a north american team picked up zen uh for their first season then um technically that would be allowed but i don't think anyone would would do that that situation um so if you've gone for work reasons for reasons other than what you're doing then you, you're allowed to, to compete in, in that other region. But if you've competed in RLCS within your original region, so for example, an RLCS EU player moves to North America to do CRL in a North American university, if they then compete in RLCS, then technically we consider an import player. Um, so that's what that rule's there about, is just to try and protect people who are traveling overseas who have, like for example, if you like the doomsday situation, right? All teams who have previously made the region swap are considered dual regioned until they move back to original region. So this is to protect those who have already made those decisions. So uh, apparently Jack and Nolly would essentially be considered both North American and European until they move back to Europe and then they'd go back to just being pure European. Just to try and like protect them. Same thing for all the South American players. Um, just so that they don't get stuck in a situation where they've got to suddenly drop their rosters or have to move home or something like that. So... Uh, put a bit of protection in place for those teams who've already made the moves. And then, like I said, I think a lot of the reasons why these imports happen is due to the RLCS structure for majors and worlds, as well as the hierarchy of pay across the region. So people will move for those reasons. So I would change the system. And, and obviously this is budget dependent and whether people would want to do it. And it's something I've wanted to have for a while. Um, is I'd have majors be split to represent the regions correctly. So... Eight teams would be invited based off of the previous international events' success. So you'd look at, for example, the most recent Worlds. You'd look at the top eight, which regions were there. And then those regions would then get the first eight invites to the next one. And then you would have, essentially, a wild card every event, which would be a 32-team uh, open qualifier with some invited teams. So kind of similar to how DreamHacks were back in the day. So we had the DreamHack Pro Circuit in 2019, where each DreamHack was a 32-team tournament. The first eight teams were invited, so it would normally be 4 EU, 4 NA. Um, there were some events where it was slightly different, but typically it was it was done like that. So you would have 2 EU, 2 NA, 2 OC, 2 SAM, 2 MENA, 2 APEC, 2 SSA. So every region gets um, two, pe two people invited along to the last chance qualifier wildcard thing. And then the 18 open teams would essentially have to pay to attend the event. So they don't just get free travel and hotels. That's for the two of each region teams previously mentioned. Um, and those 18 open teams would potentially have some rulings to protect slots for the next best teams from each region. So, for example, you could have it so that, you know, the next four ranking European teams um na teams whatever it is get get first pick on those slots uh and then once they've had their like one or two days to to apply and get those slots 
then the rest of them would be open to anyone. And so it'd lo most likely be local teams, right? So if there was an EU major, you'd most likely have more EU teams traveling along to the event. Um, and the reason why this is important for me is yes, it's going to cost the, the teams more money, but ultimately esports orgs are investing in Rocket League teams and not getting to send them to LAN. And um, because of that, um, the orgs just drop their players as soon as, as soon as they're done with the season, right? Like how many players got dropped uh, before the spring major because they're like, oh, there's nothing left for these players to do. So if they could go along to the majors, it's a chance to keep orgs invested in the scene for longer. I'm sure orgs would be willing to pay the money it costs to send a team, pay for the hotel, travel and, and everything for the players because they don't obviously go and make content around it. There'd, there'd be a chance for their players to turn up to a land wearing their, their jerseys and everything. So it's a great opportunity for those orgs. They'd be willing to pay for it. And if they're not, ultimately, it's just open slots, right? So they, they they can just go to whoever's local in the end. So if an org doesn't want to pay for it, they don't have to. Um, I think it would also be good because, you know, the, the, the storylines that Rocket League loves are these crazy stories of unexpected teams going on unexpected journeys, right? And if you had this open system, you know, we could get a team like we did back in the day with DreamHack of three... I mean, it happened with Rettles first... Uh, win was at DreamHack Montreal. Um, we saw the Peeps competing on LAN, and they they won the whole thing as an unrepresented an, an, an unsigned team went the whole way and, and stepped up on on the big stage, right? And that would be so cool to see those storylines happen again. Um, but it would also be like think of you know the the chance for like um, Hogan mode to find an org to send them to the for the next major for example or something like that would be amazing and then they'd be able to compete on LAN and so on and so on so I'd want that open system to allow for uh for that to happen it would also help balance out the region representation stuff because each region gets their two teams sent there and then you know like if there is a strong third team they're almost definitely going to get sent along because the org knows they got a chance to, to win it and also with the eight region uh eight top performing regions getting those first eight slots invited to the main event thing that would help those teams because they would bypass the, the qualifiers their regions would get would get more representation and so on so uh, i think people would have more reason to stay within their own region as well if that means that their region could be stronger and contribute to the major spots more often um same sort of thing at worlds uh, top eight there plus eight from the last chance qualifier same system as before the two from each region invited and eight, 18 open teams and that one maybe it might not be an open system maybe you could create for the worlds it would be instead be a closed 18 teams who would be um the next best performing teams from each of the regions right so you could lock those specifically to those teams um from there and then that's that's sort of the way i'd love to see it this last chance qualifier thing um, I think it's great for storylines, it's great for orgs, it's great for players, they get to compete on LAN, um, it's great for those storylines of this crazy new team that's never done well uh, online or has only done slightly well online, just missed out on, on an event, like we get to see NRG at every single major in Worlds, right? So like it's good for the esport, um, because of the fact it's open, it, it wouldn't be as much extra cost for Cyanix, there obviously would be because it'd have to cast it and so on and so on. They'd have to have staff there looking after the players and everything like that. But ultimately, the travel, hotel, and player costs uh, would not be covered by them. So therefore, they're saving a lot of money in that sense. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's that much cheaper having the open teams. But it definitely is much a much easier sell, I think, to, to Cyanix. But anyway, this video has gone on a lot longer than the first video did. Partly because um, I'm quite tired and went to a party yesterday. So my brain is a bit foggy. Uh, you probably could tell during the video, but it was also quite a deep, quite a long, long topic, quite a deep topic. So it's quite a lot of stuff to go through here. Um, but let me know what you think about my suggested ruling here. Um, I would be open to the idea of a two thirds rule rather than the one third rule uh, for imports. Um, but yeah, ultimately, I think we need to do something about this now before it gets out of hand and we start to see that same problem that we've seen in some other esports where it gets dominated by the strongest region. Um, and I guess let me know what you think about the idea of doing a video around formats because um i've sort of hinted at some of the ideas i have here but i'd love to talk about things like the different 
in-game formats like Swiss, double limb, single limb, etc. Uh, groups to try and talk about which one I think is the fairest and which is the best and which ones we should try and lean into more next season. So um, let me know what you think in the comments and I'll check you in the next video.